then he said he remembers one of his classes where they showed your your job your 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 income prospects depended on engineering degree and of course it went from nothing up to you know up to very high for a ba then the masters it went down a little bit and the phd it went right off the scale again down <laughs> so it's like don't bother <laughs> not worth your time having my cup of tea even though it's quite late here <laughs> Um, do, do you want to share your slides, uh, Robin? Yes. Yes, I do. Do you want to get going? We can get going. Uh, yeah, we, we might as well get started. Um, and, sure. and for the kind of secondary audience, I mean, as well as the, the first, um, I, I'll, I'll yeah. do a quick introduction for you. Um, and, and, you know, so uh, just as a, as a note to everybody, uh, we're, I'm, I'm recording the talk. And, and so, um, and, and I'll be publishing this online a, a bit later. Um, uh, so, so anyways, the, the, um, the inter, the Internet Study Center, uh, aims to foster the, uh, the interdisciplinary approach to the study and design of digital technologies. Uh, my name is Bessie O'Hara. I'm the director of, of, uh, of the ISC. The, the lecture series, um, is presenting leading scholars and practitioners whose work challenges and extends our understanding of digital technologies and its place in the world. Um, our guest today, Robin Boast, is a Professor of Cultural Information Science at the University of Amsterdam. And for over 30 years, he has worked on the history, practice, theory, and performance of information and technology in cultural institutions and society. Uh, he's been deeply embedded in research in the fields of museology, history, and sociology of science, post-colonial studies, information studies in the United States, Canada, Australia, and Europe. His research has focused on diverse topics ranging from the first digital collection projects in museums and universities in the 1970s, to the history of knowledge and its ontologies to indigenous uh, uh, digital knowledge rights to the, the history of digitality. His recent book, The Machine and, uh, and the Ghost, Digitality and its Consequences, traces a history of digital encoding from its beginning in the 1870s to the explosion of microprocessors in the 1970s. It's a, it's a fascinating book, really, really um, uh, an easy read, you know, and, and, you know, it's a pleasure to read it. So I highly recommend you check it out. Um, and the format for today's uh, talk is, is, is less of a lecture and more of a kind of conversational seminar. And Robin will be sharing a series of slides and, and we'll sort of, uh, sort of artifacts from, uh, and, and we'll have a conversation about each of them. So, so, uh, so, can you, uh, you want to share your slides, Robin? Yes, I will. I'll share them now. Uh, pl 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 there we are. Share. And I'll turn this into a, just a slideshow there. Can everyone see that? Yes. Is everyone, digi is everyone digitally nodding? Yes, that there I see a thumbs up, good. Um, so that's, in, that's even three thumbs up, even better. Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm talking to you from Italy at the moment, um, right down in the heel, <laughs> so, but it's late at night. Um, I'm having a cup of English tea, though. Um, yes, Dustin said, I like, <clears throat> I prefer this to be more seminar, so please feel absolutely free to ask questions. Um, you know, we have a lot to do, um, but nonetheless, ask questions, and if we run off on a little tangent, that's okay. I don't mind that, um, and this is going to be very informal, okay? Although we've got a lot of information here, and my goal is, in thinking about digitality, is to get you to think slightly differently about it. One, I want you to think more in time depth, because there's very bad histories about digitality. Um, you know, there's some good ones too, but generally a lot of them are a little bit weird. Um, and there's a lot of people who we should remember who we don't often. Um, and also we, you know, we have to remember what that technology is and what it's for, what it was originally for and how that persists, but also changes, of course, it doesn't, you know, and also some of the technologies that were left behind that were nonetheless quite good technologies. Um, so we're going, so again, we're going to start here which is a funny looking machine. 
And I don't know if any of you know, I might ask, I might during the talk ask you questions that I know you can't answer, <laughs> which is unfair, but it's, it adds to the fun a bit, you know? I don't expect you to know these things um, because, it's because I didn't know them until I started the book. So, I mean, that's fine too. Um, does anyone have a clue what this is? Some sort of no one's diving device, in. perhaps. Yeah, I yeah, it's a recording device in a way. Yes, it's also a transmitting device, um, which is interesting. It's a telegraph. But what's interesting about this particular telegraph, which was invented by a guy by the name of Emile Badeau, by the way, this is where we get Baud rate. Baud is named after Emile Badeau, okay, in honor of him doing this. Um, and what this, okay, so this telegraph, he invented this telegraph just after the Franco-Prussian War, uh, when Paris was serious, France was seriously embarrassed by the Prussians. Um, and he worked for the National Telegraph Office in France, and he thought there was a better way of transmitting besides Morse code or the English. The English also had their own, their own telegraph system, which wasn't Morse. It was a completely it used little needles that went back. It was kind of strange, but anyway, um, they used that for a long time throughout the empire. Um, but he did, and what the important thing about this device, please notice the little keypad down in your lower left. Keep that in your mind. We're going to come back to that later. That funny little thing that looks like two white keys, a black key, and two and three white keys. Okay, that's really important because what Emile Badeau was doing and the tape on those reels was he was basically, he was encoding digitally in binary letters. And as you can see here, this is a, this is a Baudot tape. This is actually a Baudot Murray tape, which I'll explain in a minute. But as you can see, it's a five bit encoding. And it's the five bit encoding that started to be used from 1874 by the French. Okay, so there, by 1876, there was a telegraph line between Paris and Rome using this telegraph. Uh, over time, it took over more and more um, and developed. Um, and it, and basically, you know, the, it was a, because there was also a shift, there were 64 characters, right? So it's a five bit, which is 32, and then you shift it up and you get 64, okay? So there was a shift key. Um, and it was purely electromechanical, totally electromechanical, but it was a telegraph. And it would, you would type in, it's interesting, the, the operators typed, that's why you had that funny keypad, type the binary directly, okay? They, they had to learn binary. They had to learn the binary encoding, okay? And had to type, trans, you know, basically translate the letters into binary. Um, and then it would do it on this, this um, you know, on this tape, and they could transplay it, trans you know, they transmit it multiplex, which is, of course, the interesting aspect of Baudot as well. We're talking the end of the 19th century, right? Um, and they say they, trans they transmit it multiplex um, in batches using these, in losing these, these, uh, these punch tapes, which, of course, survived well into the 60s. I even saw computers with these punch tapes on them when I was not, I was younger, a lot younger, but anyway. Um, so this is the interesting thing. And of course, this is, so this is the origin of what we think of today as the digital. And that's why this is, this is a really important tape because for the first time you had an encoding and there've been encodings, but obviously there was the Morse, which is a five that we call a five, feature encoding because it has five features uh, that are part of the encoding. It's not by, it's not digital. It's not digital at all. It's a five, it's a five phase encoding because you have the dots, you have the dash, you have the gap between the dots and the dashes. You have the gap between words, I mean, between, between letters and you have the gaps between words. <laughs> so it's a five phase encoding. Uh, this is, but this is truly binary, two bits. And of course, if you notice the tape, the non-holes are just as important as the holes. 
This is the other aspect, which was new. Okay. Today, you know, for you as, in, as computer engineers and com computer scientists, or if people are at least interested in computing, you understand, of course, that's much more, that's, that's fairly basic. You know, it's either on or off, and off is just as important as on. But this was the first time that got turned, that idea got turned into an encoding. Okay. And we can see here how that encoding worked. Um, now this is a this is a little bit more complex because this is showing two different codings because the encoding changed a bit over time um, and the reason it so you know it's a typical kind of what we would today you know if you if you're if any of you are young old enough to remember ASCII you know don't know you know these days it's all Unikey or something else but you know there's still some ASCII out there you still remember it this is basically the foundations of ASCII. As a matter of fact, the capital Latin letters in Badeau's code, well, in a transform, slightly later transformation, are precisely the same binary bits that are in the 16 bit, uh, in the seven bit ASCII, okay? That was developed much later in the 50s and early 60s. So, you know, we're seeing a huge continuity here the massive amount of continuity from this form of digitality. And the only change really that happened to that significantly was by this guy, who's Donald Murray. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him either. Uh, probably not. Interestingly, he was not an engineer. He wasn't, uh, he didn't work in telegraphs. He was a journalist, an Australian journalist. Um, and, but he had the very bright idea of putting the new, relatively new, not that new, but relatively new typewriter key, keypad onto a Murray, onto a Bado telegraph. So, you know, he, he's, you know, so he's the one who basically transformed then the telegraph into something much, much more powerful than it had ever been before. Now he did this at the very beginning of the 20th century. We're talking about 1905, 1906, 1907, I think his patents 1908. Um, you know, and so, you know, we're talking very early still, we're still nowhere near electronic computers, right? So we're, we're not even there. R Robin, so, I, sure, I, I have sure. a quick question. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, but you're framing this as part of a sort of continuity of, mm -hmm. you know, the digital digitality. Um, but what were some of the sort of um, considerations that were specific to like the, the materials of the time, right? They're like the materiality, the objects themselves, the constraints of these kind of mechanical systems uh, that kind of informed the design. Were, were there, you know, in terms of uh, does, was the, the were the choices that were made in terms of the encoding so informed in some ways by the the, the limitations of the machines? Uh, no, I think it was probably the other way around. In that Bado's invention became very popular very quickly, although it took a while because the key the keying was very wasn't that efficient. Because and also you had to have you know like a like with a telegraph operator you had to have quite a high level of skill. Um, the thing is it was much faster than, than Morse. And, and also the thing that it solved was the problem of error, both sending error and receiving error. Now, of course, there's still always the potential for error at the keypad. I mean, that's true today, right? Um, you know, but um, the thing is this really minimized error. The, and also the thing is it was more efficient because you could send Badeau code through multiplex, but you couldn't send Morse through multiplex. Right. So in other words, you can send multiple signals all at the same, so multiple transmissions all at the same time down the same wire. And you could do it in bulk. So they could type up the messages, run the tapes and send it down multiplex. So the thing was, it was actually, what it was doing was making a, almost a quantum leap in the ability to transmit information. And then Murray comes along and adds a keyboard to that. And all of a sudden you, any, and it was just at that moment when you're getting a lot of secretaries, back then managers didn't type, 
um, but a lot of secretaries and things like that who could who were learning to type because of you know the new rise of typewriters and so forth. So all of a sudden you had a numerous people who could be part of that communication system. And it really grew very rapidly. Um, the interesting thing was, of course, that if I go to my next slide, and I hope I'm answering your question, I'm not sure I am, but um, this device here is a teletype. You might have heard of teletypes. This is one of thousands of different kinds of teletypes. If any of you have seen Good Morning Vietnam, the two twins, the two kind of faddish twins in their little room um, with the little machine going, da -da 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 that's a teletype. Those use what's called the TTY code, which is Bado Murray. It's a Bado Murray code. So what we have to remember is this was a sea change in communication and mediation of text. I think that's the key thing. What we're seeing here is not a change in computation. I'll get there in a minute. But what we're seeing is a real leap forward in telecommunications and the mediation of text, turning it into what we think of today as digital media. This is really digital media of text, right? And what happens is, is which is really interesting, is just after the First World War, where telecommunications become really central because of the war, almost the entire world takes on the TTY code as their, their form of telecommunications of text. In other words, what we think of as telegraphs. So all telegraph traffic pretty much, um, at least by, by wire and, and, and so forth, by 1924 was digital. It was digital, all, almost all. You know, still ship, you know, still over air was a lot of, a lot of Morse. But um, basically, you know, by then, by 1924, okay, it was all digital. And that continued, well, well, I think the last telex station closed in India of all places in 2007. You know, that's how long it lasted, yeah. So this, but I think more important than its duration is the idea that the foundations of digitality is more in encoding than it is in computation. And that's the kind of message I want right at this very beginning. Now I'm gonna complicate that. I'm gonna complicate that over the, over the course of the talk. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna complicate that right now, if, if that's okay. But Dustin, did that answer your question more or less? Uh, yeah, I, I think there was, um, I, I, I just, re I remember uh, an anecdote in your book about how there was um, uh, that, like that, there were decisions made in the in the design of the encoding that had to do with the the wear and tear of the machines themselves, and like how the ah, yeah. kind of the encoding of the of of punching holes into paper was prone for you know like that basically to to minimize um, uh, the point you were making in the book was the idea that like words. And letters that were very common were intentionally chosen to have uh, the 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 least number of of holes punched in through the paper, right? So that it would, you know, so that obviously, you know, when you in, at this point it doesn't make a difference, but at the time because of the material constraints of of these uh, of of the technologies, there was it was important that made a difference in how how efficient they ran yeah that's okay i misunderstood you sorry yes that's again back to donald murray i mean not only okay donald murray kind of initiated the process but he didn't do everything obviously but of course his one of he transformed baldo's code um changed the letter formats and and things so that a for instance is only one dot you know e has two you know so it's, yeah, and his was to, one, to, yeah, it's basically to, to preserve the, um, basically to, you know, to preserve the, the machinery, because one of the big concerns at the time was, of course, wear and tear on machinery. It was very expensive, but also wear and tear on the typewriters. 
So the QWERTY keyboard, for instance, was designed around, you know, having finger access and actually mechanical movement of the, the keys so that the most frequently used keys were the ones that were less prone to error, right? Less prone to breakage, to, to error, to jam. Um, if you've ever used any, I don't think anyone here except me probably has ever used an old typewriter that literally had the arms, they did jam, you know, if you got really typing real quickly. Is that a hand coming up from Corey? Oh, uh, not a hand up, but I have, I have used a mechanical typewriter. When I was hey, a kid. well done. Yeah. <laughs> well done. I typed my MA thesis on an electric typewriter. <laughs> That's how old I am. Um, you know, uh, I was very fancy. I had an electric typewriter. Um, but um, yeah, so they would stick. And so these are real concerns, you know, real concerns. And also, you know, also because the electromagnetic, what these, the tapes ran over little electrum, you know, electromagnetic um, readers. So there's a hole that you get a contact and if there wasn't, you wouldn't. And those would cause error and, and wear out and so forth. So you had to worry about that. So it was a, you know, it was worrying. And I, actually, that's a very good question, Dustin, because that gets us into the next part of my story really, really well. <laughs> this idea of mechanical problems, problems of, of mechanical processing, because this is processing, you know, digital text, but electromechanically. And so you have to worry about the mechanics. You know, okay, you, we have to worry about other, you know, entropic problems with, you know, with, you know, with, uh, you know, electronic computers today with our laptops and things, but it's a different set of worries. Um, but that actually takes us nicely to this guy and what he's standing in front of. Because this is where now we're going to think, okay, we're going to take it, we've, we've moved away now. We've kind of moved off of telegraphs and we're moving now up a different route where the two are going to meet in the future, um, thinking about computation. So anyone know who this guy is? And I imagine most of you have heard of him, but you may not know, know him by, by his look and what he's standing over. Well, this is, this is Bush, right? Yeah. Yep, it's Vannevar Bush. Yes, this is Vannevar Bush. As we may think, do you all know that, that article? Well, I've assigned it to some of the students, but I'm not sure if these students have read it. Okay, you may not all know. He's very famous now um, in particular because he wrote an article in 1947, uh, actually wrote an early draft during the war, but in 1947 where he introduced his idea of what he called Memex. And Memex was his idea, people have appropriated it as being the first kind of imaginary of the internet. I have a lot of problems with that. I quite disagree, and it's not that I disagree in principle, but he wasn't really talking about, the, about something like the internet. He was thinking of something more personal, something less generalized, less standardized, more about, as we'll get into in a, mi in a bit, the ideas of some of the people in the 60s around the early ideas of hypertext, but not hypertext in the, in the simple sense, but in a kind of personal trails which never kind of really materialized on the, on the internet. Um, and he saw that as something to help. And he was thinking purely in electromechanical terms, analog terms. He wasn't thinking, he was using photography, he was using tape recording, he was using electromechanical machinery, like what he's, the thing he's standing in front of. The thing he's standing in front of is his differential analyzer that he built at MIT during the 30s. Uh, Computation was a problem then as it is now, and differential equations were important and becoming increasingly important because of the impending war, um, you know, the impending World War II. And differential equations, as you all, if you're engineers know, are important for shell trajectories and dropping bombs from airplanes, right? Um, not the best use, but anyway, there you go. That's what it was. This was the most advanced computer right, thing that computed in terms of, you know, of, of computed differential maths in the, in the 1930s and the 1940s and actually continued to be the most powerful computer in the world into the 1950s. 
It was, you know, and it is purely analog, as you can see. You know, it's purely analog. So back to Dustin's point, what's interesting about this, of course, is that what makes this work is extremely fine tolerances in the multiple metal bits that interact with each other, cogs, gears, wheels, um, you, know, uh, you know, screws and all the rest, that work to achieve the result. And what Bush did with his team was to also add some other components. So he added some electronic components, not electronic like we think of, nobody had transistors then, but he did add relays, sets of relays, um, you know, you know, electro, you know, electromagnetic relays. Um, and he added uh, servos to it as well, electronic, uh, you know, electro, you know, electronic servos that he would add to that. And that would improved his accuracy quite a bit. And so it was one of the most accurate computers at the time. And of course, though, it also needed a phenomenal amount of maintenance. You know, so to get it to run, by the way, girls, the first person who used this was a woman engineer, by the way. She was uh, modeling electrical, um, electrical distribution um, systems in Texas. She was an electrical engineer. I forgot her name. I was terrible. I shouldn't forget names. I have a bad, I have a bad memory for names. But anyway, so the first person who used this computer was a woman, technically. Um, so, and so, but that needs a lot of maintenance. And one of the people who maintained this, this is also important, another person you might not know about is this guy who's juggling. He's a very good juggler. He was an expert juggler. He was also uh, made quite a bit of money cheating at blackjack in Las Vegas. Uh, his card counting system is still used today for blackjack, for cheating at blackjack. He had a little, um, um, tactile calculator for his pocket for calculating probabilities when playing blackjack in um, in Las Vegas and made a fair bit of money at that. Um, he's also was an engineer at MIT and a professor at MIT. <laughs> I hope your current professor doesn't cheat at blackjack, but uh, <laughs> he did. Uh, does anyone know who this one is? Who this guy is. He, oh, he also liked going around the halls of MIT on his unicycle, um, which is quite nice. But uh, um, did anyone know who this is? So, sounds like he, he would make for, uh, he could have joined the circus, you know, that's. Well, yeah, I mean, he was, he made wonderful inventions. He made this fantastic called, uh, invention called, um, um, what does he call it? He called the universal machine, where it had a box with a switch on the front. You click the switch, it opens a mechanical hand, a robotic mechanical hand, comes out and turns the switch off and closes the box. <laughs> Wait, is, this, is this Shannon? Cla yes, hmm. yes, this is Claude Shannon. Yeah, Claude Shannon. And every, you know, everyone knows Turing. Now, Turing was a great man. You know, what he did in many areas of, you know, of computational mathematics and so forth is legendary now. Uh, he was the first person to think of a sequential processor um, rather than an analog processor. That's true, 1936. You know, not to take anything away from Turing, but why nobody knows Shannon, I don't know. Because he's far more important to our story than Turing was for a number of reasons. Um, so besides Juggler, he was also Bush's master's student in the 19, mid 1930s. And it was Shannon's job to maintain, one of the people to maintain the differential analyzer. Um, so he had to change the gears and he did a lot of the work on the electronic components as well as a master's student, okay? And he, while he was doing that, had, some, had an idea and he thought, you know, hey, and I'll do that for my MA thesis. And this is what's called now the most important MA thesis of the 20th century. Now we should always as historians be careful of those kind of designations, but as an MA thesis, if you're thinking of you know, computers today, yeah, it probably was. Um, so what he thought 
what his thesis was about was his idea that he could apply this extremely obscure uh, area of mathematical logic to relay circuits, to relays, you know, mechanical switch, you know, electro, you know, electromechanical switches, um, and that extremely, you know, obscure bit of logic that he you know, chose was Boolean logic. And nobody, you know, it was a kind of a, nobody worked on Boolean logic. It was a kind of interesting side thing. Nobody really took it very seriously. It was kind of nice for a few interesting people, but nobody really did. But he thought you could do Boolean logic with relay circuits, with switches. And so that was his MA thesis. And of course, so there you are, there's the foundation you know, we're talking to each other now from different sides of the world. We all have our laptops in front of us, our phones, whatever, you know, the whole, did, you know, they all work by this. This is what they do. <laughs> you know, they do this because of this idea. Now, someone else may have come up with it later. We don't know. We can't look back in history, but he's the guy who came up with this idea. And that's an important idea. <laughs> and it, it helped also that he was Bush's student, because of course, Bush was not only the person at MIT who ran that, but he was Roosevelt's head of science um, during the war. Uh, he was head of the Manhattan Project. He was considered by the end of the war, one of the most important scientists in America. Um, you know, he ran the entire research program for the US war effort. Uh, so he was a rather influential guy. Um, so that helped. So actually, I mean, you can see, I don't know, can you see the little guy standing way in the back? Hopefully it's not behind your menu at the top of your screen, but there's a guy at the back with the differential analyzer. That's Claude Shannon at the back of the room there. So there he is actually maintaining this device. I, I think and we have a, up. a question or comment from sure. Walter. Sure. Oh yeah. Um, so you mentioned that Boolean uh, logic existed before uh, any of this like computer theory. Uh, what was the application or like, why do you know? Uh, Boole originally came up with it mostly because he was just interested in it abstractly. No one could think of an application for it. That's really quite interesting. Even Boole himself couldn't think of any applications for it. It was really just an exercise in mathematical law, abstract mathematical logic. So Bull didn't develop Boolean logic for any purpose. Um, and he didn't think of any purpose. And, and because nobody, he didn't, most even mathematicians, let alone engineers, didn't even know of Boolean logic. So it was kind of interesting that, you know, Claude Shannon, because he was so eclectic, had come across and studied a bit of Boolean logic, mostly just because out of interest. I think as a teenager, he did it. So he came across it as a teenager before he even started university. And so, you know, and actually at the beginning, and we'll get into that in a second, most people even didn't think that, you know, that Shannon's thesis had any application. Bush didn't think it had any application. He thought, oh, this is really interesting, but what the hell are we going to use it for? You know, what can we do with that? Okay, we've got, you know, we've got this calculator here. I mean, this thing's, you know, powerful. You're going to do some, you know, tinker toy you know, uh, computations with a bunch of relays. I mean, they're too slow, right? <clears throat> you know, and in fact, a uh, German just before the war uh, tried to build a calculator using Boolean binary logic using relays. I mean, literally relays. And although it worked, it was terribly slow. I mean, it was really slow and very, very, very crudely inaccurate. I mean, I think it, you know, work to like one or two decimal points max. So it wasn't very accurate, you know? So that's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's a good question by the way, yeah. Um, so nobody thought that much of this, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing he was thinking of also, you know, um, it really is a very crude electromagnetic relay. So it's slow, you know, this is really slow compared to even, you know, and so we're, 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 you know, ideas are way ahead of the technology. The technology isn't there to catch up with these ideas. And we'll see that takes a long time. 
that takes quite a long time. Ultimately, of course, that little guy there would lead to this. And does anyone know what this is? Getty image. <laughs> no idea. Okay, I'll, okay. This is, well, it's not the first transistor. It's a replica of the first transistor. <laughs> 1959, no, 1958, excuse me. 1958, the very first transistor. And um, so, you know, it took a long time. So, you know, we very quickly we had transistors, but of course transistors didn't really get used in computation until really into the 60s. So, but I mean, you know, so it's, but it's important for us to remember, for those of you who aren't engineers, this does the same job as that, right? They're both the same in principle, they're switches. You know, the light switch on your wall is the same, right? It's, on, it's an on or off switch. It's just, you know, the only advance here is this is very slow and that's much quicker. Right. And of course, now we've got, you know, system on a chip with the M1 coming out of Apple. I heard recently that IBM has made a breakthrough into a two nanometer transistor. You know, so we're talking, you know, an order of magnitude of 50 billion switches on a chip. You know, so that's how far we've come. Um, you know, but they're switches, right? They're switches. They're an on off switch. That's it. You know, um, but it's interesting, you know, to see that. It's also interesting to think of other things that were happening at the time. This is a letter, again, to Vannevar Bush from Claude Shannon, who's also telling him about his other idea, which is Claude Shannon is much more famous for, in Strangely, um, which is on information. And Claude Shannon was the first person um, to coined the term information in the way we use it today. And he used it because of his idea of information being, you know, encoded signal. And he was thinking of radio signals at the time because this is, this is also very early. This is, uh, I have to remind myself of the days, 1939. Um, so he, was, he associated um, signal potential and error correction with entropy with the mathematical entropy, not with, the, not with conceptual entropy, but with mathematical entropy, okay? And what that led to, interesting, was the field of information science, as it was called before, during the 50s and 60s, which isn't what we mean by it today, which was compression. So what we see here is also the foundations out of these group of people of even compression technologies. So, you know, all compression that, you know, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, JPEG, you know, all these compression regimes draw their roots mathematically and conceptually to this letter and this idea. Cybernetics also picks up on this conceptually and turns it into something else altogether again, differently that we don't really pay a lot of attention to today as well. But that's a, that's a side story. I don't really want to go there because I want to keep on this track. But so we have these things going around at this moment, just before the war. You have the idea that you can use Boolean logic and binary. You have people who've been for ages, decades, transmitting uh, text via binary, all teletype, all telegraph tra tra traffic is binary. Almost everything else is analog, okay? And this is a debate about analog and digitality. Now, by the way, it's up to this, we're getting just about to the, we're not even at the point yet where any of this is digital. Now, what I mean by that is that up to this point, nobody is using the term digital in this sense. The only people using the term digital, and I've done the research through old archives of, uh, of articles and things like that, is doctors, right, medical, talking about, you know, uh, basically, you know, the medical problems of, of the fingers, you know, or toes, 
So that's digitality up to this point in the journals has nothing to do with, you know, with computing. It has to do with, with medical problems of your fingers and toes. Um, so nobody's using the term at this point, um, which is interesting. And that's coming quite soon though. And it's interesting why that happens. And we're gonna start by looking, I thought a lot about this sequence in the book and here, and I hope this works. I've kind of changed the sequence the way I usually talk about it, because it gets kind of complicated. We're in the middle of the war now. And this is an electronic computer. Do you know which one? Again, I'm asking you questions I don't expect correct answers to, which is very mean of me. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be so mean. It's not ENIAC or you know, EDVAC or any of those. It's not even in the US. Is this in the this, of course, is Yeah, this is Colossus. This is Colossus, which is the first binary computer. Well, you could say Zeiss was also, but um, you know, this is, this is the first really working binary computer. And that's important to say binary, because as we'll see, not all computers after this were binary. But this one was, because it was, and, then, and there's a lot of confusions around Colossus, not only because nobody knew the, about its existence except the few people who worked on it until the 1970s. It was highly classified. Even the Americans didn't know the British had this. After the war, they disassembled most of them. A few went on to work in the postal offices, but under high security. Um, this was to decode the uh, German um, the German encoded uh, radio traffic, which was transmitted using Badomery, um, you know, binary encoding, like all telegraphs. But it was, but it was in code. The letters weren't the real letters, right? But they were letters, but they weren't the real ones because uh, they were encoded and very complex. We know about that stories, you know. And they had many different. They didn't just have Enigma. Enigma was only one of about six or seven different systems the Germans used. And contrary to belief, this did not decode the letters. This did the maths to find the wheel patterns of the encoding machines, which were then, dec then decoded. So it didn't actually do any letter processing. This was purely for maths. But please notice, of course, the Bado tape running through there. Um, so it would take its input from a five bit uh, punch tape, which of course was straight from the telegraph, uh, from the telegraph office, you know, down the road. Um, so, but this was, this is not Turing's bomb. That was a, that was a different computer and that one was analog. Turing's bomb that he built to do, the, to start this process, and this came almost immediately after and was done by someone, it was done by another person. Um, Turing didn't have anything to do with this computer, by the way, but, uh, you know, strange note, I think it's just one of the vagarities, no real reason that he didn't. He just, you know, he was working on other things. Um, you know, so this is, this is, now this is interesting because this didn't lead very much to the movement of electronic computers in the initial process. This did lead to this mess, which is, the man, what we call the Manchester baby. And this is the computer, the guys from, you know, uh, Bletchley Park, which was the encoding thing, who did work on Colossus. Several of them did go and get positions then in Manchester University, and they built one of the first uh, binary computers to operate in Europe besides Colossus, but nobody knew Colossus was there. Based on Colossus to a degree, um, well, of course, without ever mentioning Colossus um, because they weren't allowed to. Um, the interesting thing about this one is that it led to the very first commercially available computer. Does anyone know what country built that? No ideas? See, I, I loved it because I like messing with your brains, you see, because we have all these stories about how this works. And it didn't work like, it kind of worked like that, but not really. It's interesting, Italy. Hmm. Because the, the Manchester baby after the war, because of cross-border support and because the idea that if you had more collaboration, 
you'd have less likelihood of fascism rising again. So it was part funded by Olivetti in Italy. And Olivetti's first computer was a copy of the Manchester baby. And it was the very first commercially available computer in the world, which was binary, which is interesting because not all computers were binary. Uh, very few were at the time. So was that first was that first commercially sure. available computer sold to like businesses for accounting stuff or like universities yeah. for research or what? Yes, exactly. Well, less the universities. I mean, universities couldn't afford them. Very large businesses. They only sold, and they, you know, you're talking, a, you know, a project where you sell. If you sell two computers a year, you're doing really well, you know. But they cost, you know, they probably cost close to a million, and that's a kind of currency comparison, you know, a million dollars. You know, so at the time, you know, not in today's money, at the time, um, I have a lovely slide that I don't have here of them loading one of the very early hard drives into an airplane with a forklift. It was a five megabyte hard drive and it cost a quarter of a million dollars, 1956. You know, we're talking, yeah, exactly. I see tears coming out of someone's eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, storage has gone down in price a lot <laughs> over the decades. Yes, a lot. It was expensive. You know, you know, five megabytes. I mean, God, you know, that's, my first computer had five megabytes hard drive. It didn't cost a quarter of a million. Um, certainly wouldn't have been able to afford that. Um, so we're selling very, very few. And Olivetti actually never sold that many. Other things came over and took over very quickly, mostly the Americans. Um, and in America, a different trajectory was going on. And the trajectory there and the debate there during the war, and we're only beginning to get this out because of you know, things being confidential and so forth, and we're, people are really only doing the research over the last 10 or 15 years. What's interesting is there was a huge debate in the scientific community, not least including Bush, um, about the differing values of having discrete computing, as it was called at the time, what do you think of more in terms of anything that operated along Turing's model of a sequential processor and discrete packets of information um, against analog? <clears throat> and of course, at this time, even in the 50s, you have to remember that you know, Bush's anal you know, did, um, differential analyzer um, continued to operate into the 60s because it was just simply more accurate than electronic computing. So it was a real debate. I remember a friend of the family when I was just a teenager, maybe even not even that, probably when I was about, yeah, maybe a teen, I was 14 maybe. He was a strange guy. He was a, psych he was a psychiatrist who built lasers in his basement. This is 1972, right? So very early days, he built lasers in his basement. And he still insisted that analog computing would come to dominate, you know, digital processing because of its accuracy and speed. And in fact, you know, and it seems funny, but I remind you that there are some high-end applications today, you know, in, in certain areas of science, astrophysics and things, where they have very, you know, high-end analog computers to do the calculations because digital would take too long. So their analog computers can solve these problems in months where digital computers would take centuries. <clears throat> so it's, it's not that daft of an argument when you think of it back then. Now it is because it's a different world, but um, still analog is faster for some computing applications and more accurate for some computing applications, but not many, very specific ones. But this debate was raging during the beginning years of the war. And this is an interesting letter. <clears throat> it's a memo um, from a guy by the name of George Stibitz, who was an engineer at Bell Labs from 1942, where he's saying, we need a way of you know, framing this debate. Because we talk about analog, computing, and we know what that is, but there's all these other things and we talk about binary and we talk about discrete and we call, talk about sequential and we don't have a name for it. 
And so he proposes a name. And the name he proposes is, you know, you, you, you've already guessed, right? Digital. So here's the beginning of our use of the term digital in this letter. Now, this is interesting because I didn't answer this question in my book because I didn't know. And actually my editor got me onto it to, to try and figure it out because my editor said, well, why do we call it digital? It doesn't make sense. And actually it doesn't. Why would you call it digital? You know, fingers. Doesn't make sense. Does it? Does it make sense? Mm. You know, you know, historians aren't smarter than anybody else. We don't, you know, we, nobody's asked the question <laughs> until my editor did, right? <laughs> so, you know, hey, yeah, it's true. I don't know why we call it digital. So anyway, I set out to find out. That's how I found, I mean, this letter was well known, but nobody asked the question then, why does, did Stibbett say it should be digital, not binary, you know, because in America, most of the developing electronic computers at the time, and there were only two, um, were not digital. They were not binary. They were digital, but they were not binary. Okay. <clears throat> this is, of course, a famous photo. Um, hopefully, you know who these ladies are. Uh, this is ENIAC, ENIAC 1. Um, never didn't actually wind up running during the war. It actually wound up working just after the war. 19, late 45, early 46. And these ladies are the programmers. Okay, these are, they call them the Rosies. These are the Rose, the ENIAC Rosies. And there were 14 of them at the height, I think. And the, the, this, is, this is programming 1940s style. You, you know, plug boards. You're literally plugging the connections in to do the programming. And of course they were highly skilled. All these ladies, had PhDs in mathematics, um, highly skilled programmers. Um, <clears throat> they weren't mere functionaries. They weren't secretaries. You know, they were highly skilled, you know, professional math mathematicians doing this work. Um, but it's interesting because ENIAC is said to be the first digital computer. Well, that's correct, according to Stibitz, but is it binary? Well, the answer is obvious, no, <laughs> it's not. It wasn't binary. And what's interesting is why Stibitz came up is if we know how any act worked and some of the others worked as well. So we look here, this is really interesting. I love this. Um, this is any digital accumulator. Okay, because it wasn't binary, it didn't have what we think of today, and I'll have a slide in a minute, of you know, how we do you know, half adders and full adders, if any engineers in the room, any you know, you know, one who really knows how the guts work. What it did, the ENIAC literally counted on its fingers. Literally. You, you'd send a pulse in and it would, it would pulse up. You send another pulse in, it would go up to two. You'd have two pulses. You keep going up until it got, well, it has zero there, and then it goes one, two, three, until it got to nine, and then it would go to the next finger. It was a decimal system of counting on your fingers. This is why, you know, here it is. I mean, this is it. There is, there's your accumulator. And if you count those vacuum tubes, which are the storage switches, you know, there are 10 of them. Zero to nine. There's not two. They're not doing binary computation. You know, they're not doing that. They're counting up to 10 and handing it on to the next finger. This is why Stibitz called it digital, because it was machines that counted with their fingers. And in fact, it's in, you know, I, I mean, it's kind of a silly thing. I, I wanted to count how many, in this sense, if we say, okay, and of course, it's not because we use digital in a very different way and a perfectly appropriate way today. There's nothing wrong with how we use digital. But I wanted to figure out how many digital computers there would be in the world if we said they were only the ones that counted like this. And I came up with only 57. 
So that means from the beginning, there were only 57 digital computers ever made in the entire world. But of course, that's just a kind of silly joke because it's, you know, what we call digital now is much more expansive. So it encompasses binary computing as well as this computing, you know, and, you know, but all of our computers today do this. This is what they do. They don't do that anymore. They, you know, there was only 57 that ever did that. Um, and this is what they do. They do this. And this is, of course, binary computation. And this is Shannon, right? This is what Shannon thought you could do, you know, with relays. And he actually designs them, you know, the ANDs and didn't design all of them, you know, the ANDs and NORs and NOR, or, you know, the, the NANs and all those. He didn't actually come up with many of those, but a lot of them, certainly the ANDs and ORs, he came up with, you know, so he could, he could, and he actually worked out how you could actually do binary computation with switches. And that's what we're doing right here. Uh, different kinds of switches, but the switches become logic circuits. They, be, they make decisions, right? They make a decision about what's gonna happen next. And this is, you know, so we, you know, and what's interesting is the shift from digital, if you'll allow my little silliness here, of counting on your fingers, to actual binary computation happened very quickly. But it goes, of course, in Europe, almost, the, almost all the computers that were being developed were binary computers. They were doing this from the very beginning. Only in America was there a slightly different trajectory initially, but they caught up very quickly. You can see where this computer is from. You know, it's obviously from MIT. Um, and this is uh, Whirlwind and is using a screen and a light pen. This is the very first light pen interactive. It's also the very first interactive screen, interactive cathode ray screen. Any idea of when this was? Anyone want to take a guess? Early 1950s. <laughs> 19 which? Early 1950s, I don't know. Okay, you're not too far off, 1949. So yeah, 1949, yes, they were doing this. There's a very famous, um, you, some of you might have heard of Edward R. Murrow, who was the journalist, the American journalist who covered the Blitz in London for the American, you know, for the Americans. American news agencies was a very famous, he was kind of the Walter Cronkite of his day. I mean, he was very famous, shows how old I am, very famous, uh, well, the most famous journalist, television journalist later on, radio beginning then television by the early 50s. Um, there's a very famous Edward R. Murrow special of him in 1952 at MIT. Um, the computer is writing things out on a screen speaking to Murray through text. They're mo they have computer graphics. They show the first computer game. I know there's a huge debate about which the first computer game is. Um, my feeling is, and I could be proved wrong, is it's here at MIT because by 1950, 1950, they had a game. It was probably the most boring game in the world, but it was a game. You had to calculate a drop of a ball and it would fall down and bounce into a hole. That's it, you know, truly the most boring game in, you know, ever, but it was the first, you know, computer, you know, computer graphic, inter, you know, interactive game in 1950. Um, you know, so Whirlwind came up with a number of innovations, light pen, they had uh, magnetic storage, um, very first, uh, magnetic storage. They were using cathode ray tubes as uh, interactive information devices. This was the model that went on, though it didn't actually materialize exactly the same, but this was the model that went on for SAGE, to develop a SAGE in the mid 50s, which was the US, um, you know, uh, kind of computer interactive radar screen for Russian uh, nuclear attack. 
um, and which was all had computer graphics screens. Well, really by our standards, phenomenally crude ones, but nonetheless, they were computer graphics. It was also, and I always like throwing slides like this in, you know, because it kind of shakes up our, our perceptions and of course underlines the realities as well. Not just shakes up our perceptions, but underlines the realities. Um, you probably you have no idea who this person is. Um, this is Joe Thompson. He's the very first computer operator as a, as a, you know, as a, as a job description. It was the first job description and he was the first holder of that job. Um, this was, and he worked on Whirlwind at MIT. Um, a guy, you know, out of, out of, you know, out of Harlem in, in, in New York, who during, just after the war, got into a kind of, one of those kind of, let's, you know, uh, kind of imp educational improvement programs where they're learning engineering and maths. He did extremely well. And he went on to have a very, very illustrious career at Rand Corporation, um, you know, so, you know, and uh, so he was the first computer operator, an African-American, um, and went on to have a very, very illustrious career. So, you know, and we can kind of see here the kind of model that we're getting much more familiar with. Now we're in kind of familiar territory, aren't we? We see this, we say, oh, okay. I kind of, I can kind of recognize some of these bits. There's keyboards, there's printouts, you know, there's uh, a kind of little teeny screen there. You know, there's a big, lots of, you know, things in the background, which is the computer itself. You know, um, you know, I'm, I'm, this is much more familiar territory. Um, and this is, so then now we're getting into, you know, okay, binary computing. Um, other people who were working at the time, another one of my favorite photos. Um, hopefully you know who, sh who this woman is here. No, Grace Hopper. You might have. Yep, this is Grace Hopper. Well done. And this is her team, who are working, you know, on uh, Univac, basically working on the first, uh, you know, whether well, they were working at this time on the first compiler. She she is the person who developed the the idea of compiling, of a compiler, and also came up with the first compiler with her team here. Um, and uh, all guys, but please know there's none of them are white. <laughs> um, and she was uh, she was also they also were the ones who developed the first database. The team was at Rand Corporation who developed the first database. And of course, Grace Hopper is very famous. She's supposedly also responsible for coming up with the idea of a computer bug. We're not sure that's true, actually, kind of true, but we're not sure if she actually ever. She had it in her notebook, but she never really used the term. Um, so that's kind of complicated, but uh, she's certainly credited with that. You know, a uh, very important lady in terms of the early development of computing. She was the one who, who created, who worked with her team to create COBOL, one of the first languages. Uh, she was very keen to develop a language that people could talk to the computer with, which is what languages are, right? Languages developed for us, to talk to computers, right? They're not developed for the computer. Um, and she was very keen on that because she thought that would expand the use of computers, also democratize it, make it much more open. You know, basically your idea was to create software, right? Now the software existed, but it was all in kind of machine code. Um, but literally, you know, to create this kind of possibility for people who weren't mathematicians or high-end engineers to be able to make computers do things. And of course, her work and others who led on after with Fortran and other things exploded the possibilities of computers, really exploded it. Because also a thing that was going on at this time, which is very interesting, well, two things that were going on, really. Um, one, you had a lot of people out of the war, not just men, but also women, going to university because people who served in the war got free university. And so you had a massive uptake of university education in all subjects, not least engineering and other things. Um, you also had a situation where these computers were becoming built and being obsolete pretty much like now within a year or 16, you know, or, or 18 months. 
So they were being changed all the time. And what would happen is the computer, you know, version one, this is what happened to Whirlwind, version one would be replaced by version two. They called it Mark one and Mark two. And Mark one would be relegated down for the engineering department or anyone in the university who really wanted to use it. So anybody could use it. And people did. So, uh, so how, you, does this, how does this line up with the, the idea of a general purpose kind of machine rather than- uh, Yeah, we're getting, yeah, that's where we kind of end our story, yeah. I mean, the general, you, we're well, we're not really near general purpose machines yet, um, except the idea of general purpose is, well, in a way, binary computing itself allows for general purpose. And this is something Whirlwind kind of discovered, but also the, the Europeans were discovering as well. If you have a binary processor rather than a digital processor or an analog processor, um, and you know, digital, digital in the sense I was using it before, right? Digital in the sense of counting on your fingers, can only do computation. And analog can only do the thing it was designed to do. It can't solve other problems. So binary itself, because it's binary, because you can, you know, because the computer just processes binary and because Bado came up with the idea of encoding, then for the computer encoding, you know, it doesn't care. You know, it just follows the process of moving, you know, binary bits around. Now it's a bit more complicated than that, obviously, but it doesn't care what they are. Right, so you can make those through these these devices that attach to it, anything you want. I mean, one of the things I should have done it here probably. One of the things I do with my students is I have a very we're going off on a tangent, which I like. I like going off on tangents. Um, is I show a picture of the very first museum website, which was in Paris in 1994. And it was just a guy who had a server, had nothing to do with museums, but he thought you should have a museum website. So he created one. And, you know, he'd have a Monet exhibition with a dinosaur gift next to it. You know, I mean, it's weird stuff. You know, as you did in the early days of the web, it was really kind of, you know, super kitsch. You know, it's fab fabulous. I loved it. So we're looking at, it's a JPEG of the web page, right? So it's from the Wayback Machine. And so we're looking at that. And then I play, a bit of, you know, I play an, M, an MPEG file, you know, some sound, some noise. And I say, what is that noise? And it's quite horrible noise, but it's noise. And they'll go, I don't know, what is it? And I say, you're listening to the image. And all I did, of course, was, you know, change the file extension from JPEG to, M, to MPEG. And of course the computer says, oh, that's a sound file. Okay, I'll play that as a sound file. Now that doesn't work with some encodings like text, you know, and things like that. So, you know, those engineers are out there going, wait a minute, doesn't always work. Yeah, it doesn't always work. Um, but the point is, in, you know, once you have digital, once you have binary, digital is binary, then the world's your oyster. I mean, you can make anything, you can mediate anything. You can do computation. You can you can turn you can work with sound. You can you can work with imagery. You can work with film. You know you can work with you know as we do, and that happened really fast during the fifties. You know really 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 fast. You know so by you know the end of the, you know so by the end of the fifties, you have people working making computer music. You have people. Doing, try, starting to develop the very early forms of online education. And if I can go for it, I just wanted to pop these in. Melba Roy Moulton, who was one of the, um, she was basically chief of research programs at NASA. Just show you some of these girls. This, this was someone you should probably know, um, Margaret Hamilton. She was head of the uh, programming, the MIT programming team who you know, basically did the programming that allowed the guys to land on the moon, right? And she was head of it, right? She was in charge, right? 1967, anyway. So anyway, so I just throw those in just to remind you that, you know, and of course, 
this is also to remind us that it's not to say computing and society was not sexist then, it was not racist then, yes it was, in some ways much worse than today. But there were opportunities in a way that didn't, they existed then that don't exist today, which is a kind, seems kind of contradictory, you know. Um, so it's kind of weird, you know, the women and people of color could fulfill roles like that, nonetheless at that time, which seems somehow harder now, right? So that's, that's a, you know, that's a much bigger question that we have to address differently, you know, because it certainly wasn't that it was less sexist or less racist. If anything, it was much more, much worse than, than it is now, far worse than it is now. So, you know, that's an interest, but they, you know, but there's also kind of a bit of hope there. Yes, I mean, computing has had women and people of color in it from the beginning. There's absolutely no reason why these people shouldn't be there now, none whatsoever. Um, you know, and um, so just to throw that in, but actually to take Justin's point, how fast this changed. Looking at some things here, and I've got a kind of a running sequence here of some changes that happened in the 60s, that they started in the 50s. Once you had access to a lot of a sizable number of computers, a lot of experimentation could happen. Now, these are the hands, interestingly, of uh, Doug Engelbart. And hopefully you know of Doug Engelbart. Have you heard of the mother of all demos? Has anyone heard of him? Oh, just, yeah. oh good, good. Because he only died, just died recently, unfortunately, very sadly. About, a, about 18 months ago, he died. Um, a sad loss. And please know that here it's interesting. Of course, on the right, you have his famous mouse, which he, inv he and his team invented. Um, you know, and on the left, do you notice what that is? I told you in the first slide to remember something. That's a five bit keypad, like Bado. Because Engelbart thought that one of the interfaces that you would need because a keyboard is so inefficient was a five bit, you know, keypad. But geez, as, as, you, as one does, it's easy to learn. Uh, it isn't, but his idea was it was easy to learn five bit encoding of characters and you could just type them straight in using the binary encoding. That didn't take off. Interestingly, though, it does exist still. It's highly popular amongst uh, blind people, people who are, you know, who have, you know, are blind. They use, they prefer to type. They usually use it to type binary, or they type Braille directly in with a five, you know, five five finger key, hmm. and they use this key. So this keypad still exists for people or you know as an interface on the computer um but it the idea of, of us all learning binary encoding of characters could you imagine typing 16-bit character format or or six you know 64-bit unicode i don't know no thank you uh that'd be really quite horrible uh that one didn't take off but the mouse did and the keyboard did and here he is talking in 19 67. He was speaking at the associate uh, the ACM conference. Um, uh, it was a joint ACM and uh, IEEE conference in California in 1968 when he presented his ideas of using the computer. And he was thinking purely in terms of mainframes, right? This is before the microcomputer. He's thinking in terms of mainframes. Um, although he is networking, there was a video link. There was a, a video conferencing link with Menlo Park during the presentation. And uh, he was looking at how you can create everyday useful apps, kind of doing what they wanted to do here, right? I'm, I'm, I'm backwards, so I have to think here. Um, you know, so he has Windows, he has WYSIWYG, um, you know, uh, word processing, these sorts of things, all on a mainframe. And he never got his mind in a way out of mainframes. He always thought in terms of kind of that mainframe processing. 
which was very powerful. And he wasn't the only one either. There was this young guy here, a handsome California kid, um, son of an Emmy Award winning director and a, an Academy Award winning actress. You know, does anyone know who that is? Ted Nelson. Yeah, Dustin's hitting, batting a thousand, isn't he? Ted Nelson, Ted Holm Nelson. Yes, the uh, son of Randolph Nelson and Celeste Holm, the actress. And he's, of course, important to this story in a funny way because of this paper here. And of course, you can, I highlighted it for you. He's, of course, the one who came up with the idea of hypertext. Uh, and hyper, but his concept of hyper, whatever, hypermedia was far vaster than anything we even have today. You know, he was thinking in terms of hyperfilm, films that would you'd, you'd co-assemble and, and they would and they would they would branch off into other films. Um, you know, he was you know he was really influenced by Bush and his Memex. And he wanted to think in terms of computers, again, mainframes, in terms of how you could make that work in a, in a, in a now use, me using the term digital, meaning purely binary, binary encoded environment. So now I'm going to start, stop using digital in, the, in that sense of not counting on your fingers, and I'm going to start using it the way we talk about it today. So meaning binary computing. And of course, this paper was also presented to the ACM. Um, any ideas on when? When are we talking about hypertext? I mean, this was the 1970s, wasn't it? The early 1970s that he came out with his? No, no his book came out in the 1970s, but he presented this paper to the ACM in 1965. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so the first mention of hypertext was 1965. Yeah, when he presented it. His book came out in 1972, which is, oh, here. Here, I'll just leap ahead real quickly and come back to that. Computer Lib and, um, and Dream Machines. Uh, I have a first edition of this, which is very nice. He self-published it. He did all the, own, the text himself, all the layout. It's very 60s very 60s, early 70s. And here we see the page, that was a long book, it was a double book. So you read it from one side halfway through and then you turned it upside down and over and you read it from the other side. It's two books in one, two philosophical approaches. It was required reading at Apple until well into the 1980s. Um, you know, so you see here, and he builds his idea of hyper and hypermedia in that book it came out in 1972, over 10 or 15 pages. It's not a simple concept, it's very complex. And he spent his life, and somewhat sadly, um, trying to build it, Project Xanadu, trying to build his system, and he never quite got there um, for a number of reasons. You know, um, kind of, you know, became very embittered, I think, later in life. He's still alive. Uh, did he just die? I can't remember. Anyway. Um, when you get to my age, so many people are dying, you, you lose track of them. Um, you know, so anyway, so this, this whole idea, but also what's interesting about both Engelbart and Nelson is they saw this as computing becoming computing of the masses, but in the sense of something creative, something personal, something that the individual had control over, something educational. They were very focused on education. Education, especially of children, not just higher education. And that's why I have this picture here. This is some of the initiatives, only some, handful of the more famous ones from the 1960s of, computers, of computer learning with university students, but also children. So the upper left, we have Plato, which was one of the very first online mainframe, but online teaching systems in university. I took a course on Plato in 1975, but it started in 1962. 
You could, instructors could build their own courses by 1967. They could have graphics in there. They had their own ways of building uh, exams, uh, interactive graphics, touch screens. Talking 60s here. Plato's still going. It's not very used much now, but it is still going. But it's a very early program. We see students on the right using Plato in universities. Uh, on the lower left, Seymour Papert's work in creating LogoScript and his, and his turtle, which was a designed uh, language and robotics designed to teach children um, programming, you know, so they could program their own computers and take control of the computer, 1968. You know, bottom, we have an amazing program in Minnesota in the very early 70s from 19, late 69, the 69, 70, ran all the way up to 75, piggybacking on Pillsbury's mainframe for children to learn programming and computer applications in schools, elementary school and, 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 and others, you know, and, and middle school, what do you call it, junior high school and high school students. At its height, 18,000 students were taking this in the early 1970s, you know, so that very quickly, we have this, long before micros, my, there's no microchips at this time. Well, overlapping a little bit with TIES, it was called T-I-E-S. Um, you know, there's a little bit of overlap with TIES, you know, which I can't remember what, what was it was. Uh, yeah, Total Information for Educational Systems, it was called, you know, but, I don't know how we're doing for time, by the way, Dustin. Are we doing okay? Um, I, we're we're doing fine. I'd say we probably want to wrap up relatively soon, but good because we're right near the end now. We're coming into the seventies now. I finish at the end of the seventies, not because the story finishes there, but because you have to finish somewhere. So, I, like with my book, I finished there. Um, there's kind of a reason for it, but in history, you know you kind of have to draw arbitrary boundaries because time, you know, history never begins or ends, it just keeps going. But if we look then what really changed everything that nobody anticipated and why I have this picture here, um, you know, up here in the corner is nobody anticipated miniaturization. Everybody was thinking about mainframes, bigger, bigger, bigger mainframes. You had Minitel happening in France. If you don't know, I'm not gonna go into Minitel. You don't know about Minitel. You should read up on it, really interesting. You know, a uh, mainframe based national internet in France, you know, from the late 70s, not micro based. But anyway, but this little thing here changed everything. And this is a micro, this is the one of the, this is the first microchip, um, very crude microchip. It could create a sine wave on a screen. Um, Interesting, it was developed in 1959. Um, didn't go to market, didn't become a, a marketable tool until uh, Texas Instruments came out with it in very, very late, December 1971. This was also done at Texas Instruments. Interesting, the guy who did it um, was a kid who just started at uh, Texas Instruments. He showed up, they had no idea what they were gonna do with him. So he said, oh, go off and work on something that interests you for, you know, for six weeks or eight weeks and we'll get back to you when we have a project. And he went off and he built a microchip. <laughs> yeah, something he'd been thinking of at the university and just went off and built it. Um, hey, you know, I came up with this, isn't this cool? Uh, <laughs> not bad for your first eight weeks at work. Um, <laughs> um, so, but that really was a game changer. And I wanna focus on one aspect where people really picked up on the microcomputer, and yeah, I could choose thousands over the over the 70s, but I chose this one. And because of time, I won't bother you with questions. This is Alan Kay. You may have heard of him. This is him in front of the Xerox Alto, Alto in Xerox Park in the early 70s. He had a project at Xerox Park running from 1970 to 1975, which was to basically bring a team together and think, what could you do with microchips? What could you do? You know, we got these microchips, what do you do with them? Um, and they came up with all sorts of things. 
amazing stuff. Um, the very first um, microcomputer, which is the Alto there on the left, lower right is a, is a laser printer. He was doing, of course, electronic sound and stuff like that, and apps. They were building apps and so forth. This lady here, Adele Goldberg, was one of his team, a very important person who was throughout her career. She still, uh, she was president of ACM uh, in the mid eighties. She's still a fellow of the ACM. Um, she always worked on computers as educational devices. And she was deeply, deeply interested in that. At Xerox Park, they took the microcomputer and its new possibilities, pushed Engelbert's ideas right the way out there. Now we're seeing something really familiar. You have graphics, you have, over, you have multiple screens open, multiple overlapping windows, um, you know, WYSIWYG stuff, you know, this is the desktop. So the desktop emerges here, but as an educational device. Here we see Adele with some of her team, because some of the important team at Xerox Park were kids. They found working with adults to be too limiting. They, they, their mindset was too rigid. So they brought in large groups of kids to work with them and come up with things. And they developed a new, one of the very first object-oriented programming languages, Smalltalk 80. It wasn't the very first, but one of the first really functional, you know, first general purpose ones. Um, uh, and, you know, I mean, Adele went on to work with Simla um, as well, which is an object-oriented language. Um, you know, so they're they're developing apps. The kids are Smalltalk was developed so kid again, so kids could program. So the kids are writing these programs. They're developing the systems with them at Xerox Park. Okay, this is Xerox, right? Xerox has all this great work. Uh, they're doing all this wonderful stuff. They have no idea what to do with it. Um, they're you know they're a photocopying company. They're still a photocopy. They didn't know what to do with this stuff. And they thought, oh, yeah, it's all interesting, but so what? You know, yeah, nice, but nobody will ever be able to afford this. It's too expensive. I think their, I think their uh, Alto started at something like $75,000 or something. You know, it was an expensive kit. You know, um, so they, they didn't think much of it. So, but anyway, they kept, you know, the program kept going and people kept working on it. Kay kept working on it. And this is a demo. And we really are right at the end now. This is a demo that um, they did in 1979 for a group of people who had some new startups out of Silicon Valley who wanted to see the Alto program. They thought, oh, this is interesting. Um, you know, so we'll, you know, they do a demo for, I think it was only about 10 guys in the room, not many. It was very small, small beans, and they showed Alto. Most people thought, again, like Xerox is interesting, but how are you going to make that work? One guy got inspired. He had a new company with his friend. They were building computers, mostly from Hewlett Packard bits and pieces, just reassembling them um, and selling them. I worked on a couple of them, and they were, of course, oh, wait, there. They were, of course, Apple, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. But Steve Jobs was there. And this is where he got the idea. Well, certainly that inspired him to develop the idea of the Macintosh. OK, so now the Macintosh is interesting because the Macintosh is not only deeply inspired by the work at Xerox Park through the 70s and Engelbart, and Nelson, you know, and Bush, but both Apple and later IBM and Microsoft, who started fairly soon after, really pushing these new microcomputers, had a very different vision for what these machines were for. They saw them primarily for business, even Apple saw it primarily as creative industries market. So we have a shift here, and that's a whole new history. And I am ending here. 
uh, Dustin will be happy to hear. <laughs> um, at the end, you know, really at the beginning of the 80s, and, you know, we could talk about the fight between Wozniak and, you know, Steve, you know, Woz and, and Jobs about where they should go with the Lisa or if they should go with the, with the Macintosh, the Macintosh won out. The Lisa was much more inspired by the educational um, and much truer to Engelbart's and Nelson's vision, um, but it never took off. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. So we end there only because it's a kind of convenient ending point. But it goes on, and you know the, the the next part of the story is more or less your lives. But um, I'll stop there. <clears throat> uh, that was great. Thanks so much. Um, so I think um, if there are any other questions or comments that folks have, now's the time to speak up. Well, um, I'll say, you know, having, you know, spent the last few days reading your book and, and, and now sitting in with this talk, I think the, um, it's definitely inspired me to look more closely at this kind of history that you're describing. And in terms of, I, I also, you know, that, questioning this, this kind of assumptions we take in terms of the kind of linear progression, it's kind of deterministic history, right? That like things are, you know, that I think there's a lot of um, uh, value to be had in sort of potentially investigating these kind of uh, some of these older technologies and playing with them, mm -hmm. re working with them, you know, so. Yeah, and this, I mean, I, you know, I also teach um, media history. Yeah, I'm in the middle of a media history course at the moment. Uh, and um, one of the things I try and impress on my students is, you know, history, you know, we, we know what happened in hindsight because it happened that way, but that's not deterministic. Often it's by chance or, or serendipity or, or some other reason. And it could have been other, it can, any moment, it could always have been otherwise. The problem is you can't know what would have happened if it was otherwise, you know, so we can't predict the future. We can't predict what it would have been like if it had been otherwise, because it's too complicated. And there's always another story to be told in it. It's, you know, there's a, there's a huge interweaving of interesting aspects going through this. And I could have told this story any one of a hundred thousand different ways. And it still would have been kind of interesting, you know, um, you know, because the life is rich. I mean, you know, there's billions of people on the planet doing things all the time. So it's quite rich. Um, so, you know, we don't talk here about Hewlett Packard, which was a very interesting thing. Uh, the computer clubs that gave rise to, you know, the Steve Jobs and those people, um, you know, you know, again, we could have just gone on and on and on and on and on. I could have gone on and on, gone much more on analog computers, you know, so there's always that other aspect. But it's always good to remember that if you see a history that says this created that and this created that and this created that and it created it because that was the right way it could happen, be skeptical because <laughs> you know? it's probably not true. <laughs> well, well, that that was great. Um, I think with that, we'll, we'll call it a day. Uh, I'm going to stop recording now. Um.